All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a few kind of general administrative announcements that I want to talk about. And then after that, we will get into our discussion of T cell trafficking. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with a little bit of discussion of lab. Um, so if we look at the lab schedule, um, this is what we'll see. Um, and so you can see that tomorrow is scheduled as a day for data analysis and qPCR. Um, lab tomorrow is going to be optional. Your goal is eventually you are going to have to have a lab report draft and eventually a actual lab report. One of the things that needs to be in both the draft and the actual lab report is a figure of your qPCR data. I emailed all of you the raw qPCR data that has not yet been analyzed, and you need to analyze it. There is a handout on Moodle. We look at Moodle. There is a lab handout called QPCR Data Analysis Lab, as well as this, the data that I emailed you. There's also a video about the background, and there will be a part two that I haven't finished yet, um, where you will actually get to have the exciting drama of watching me go through an Excel spreadsheet of analyzing some similar data. If you would like to take your data and analyze it on your own to get to the point of having a bar graph, you can do that. If you would like to analyze your data with Eileen, who has done this about 7 million times, you can come to lab tomorrow and work through it with Eileen. Um, so it's up to you whether you want to use these resources to do the data analysis or whether you want to work through it with Eileen. In addition, there are two groups who um, I also uh, emailed who have the option of repeating some of their experiment um, tomorrow. And you'll have to let me know if you want to do that so we can make sure that everything is um, ready to go. Um, and full disclosure, um, part of the reason behind um, this lab being optional is that um, airlines are really annoying. Um, I was supposed to fly out somewhere tomorrow night late, and they canceled my flight. And they said, we'll help you by putting you on a new flight. And they picked one at 6 AM <laughs> instead of 7 PM. So I'm not going to be here. <laughs> um, but all of that information will be sort of there and ready for you. Um, and realize that the goal is a figure for this lab report draft. Again, you can work on that figure in HS112 during lab time tomorrow with Eileen or not. I will also point out, you can see that lab next week is canceled. Just so you, and that was, I say canceled, but it's been canceled since August. It was never happening. Um, I wanted to point both of these things out and just to point out that you have um, exam two on November 2nd. You have a lab report draft due on November 10th. All of the resources for those things are currently available on Moodle. So if you look on Moodle, like I said, we've got the data analysis handout your data, part of the video, there'll be another one coming up. Old sample student lab reports, drafts from papers that I have written, this sheet that I'm going to use to score your lab report draft, and the rubric, as well as a checklist that actually has a, do you have this, yes or no, for each section of your lab report, all posted. All of the old <laughs> exam twos posted. <laughs> um, so 
Make sure that you're using these two Thursday afternoons effectively. Um, use them how you want. But all that info and all that stuff to get ready for both the lab report um, and exam two are all on Moodle. So I would strongly recommend using those times uh, effectively towards both that lab report draft, which you have a fair amount of stuff already. I mean, you already had to write your hypothesis on that sheet. You already had to write your rationale for it on that sheet. So, you know, you can have a lot of things started and ready to go. And uh, please make sure that you're using that time um, wisely. Uh, on a related note, um, on Friday, our class will be on Zoom. Um, I have an email set timed to go out with the Zoom link um, so that none of us can forget it. But if for some reason we did forget it, it's also right here on Moodle. <laughs> um, so um, those are the majority of the general announcement things. Um, also, just remember there's an inquisitive to do today by 5. Um, and um, everything else that you have done this semester is graded. I had one lab assignment I hadn't graded, but I've got it here to give back to you. Um, and all of those grades are in Moodle. Um, after five, I'll put the inquisitive grades in Moodle. So your Moodle gradebook is completely up to date. OK, I think that was all of my administrative stuff. Um, so today, we are going to be addressing this issue of immune cell trafficking. Um, and I think of immune cell trafficking um, as one of the issues we think about in terms of T cells in the periphery. Um, in fact, if you look closely, you will notice that it, along with the topics that we are talking about um, the next few classes are all part of chapter eight about T cell responses in the periphery. Um, and all of these things in my mind are linked because they are all some of the events that have to happen in order to make a good adaptive immune response. Of course, in this case, we're talking about a good T cell response. So we're really kind of thinking about what's going on in this gap of time between when we are exposed to the microbe and when we actually make this good T cell response, which may be something like 10 days. Um, and there are a number of different events. An event that we're thinking about now is this event of trafficking, where we need to get the antigen into a secondary lymphoid organ. And we also need to get the um, B cells and T cells into the secondary lymphoid organ so that they can meet and do things. This problem of trafficking is a general problem in immunology. Um, it is, in fact, a problem that we could have talked about with chapter three, where we, th where we thought about neutrophils going to a site that was inflamed. So when we see um, neutrophils, sort of leaving the blood vessel, going to that site of inflammation. That actually involves the exact same trafficking problem we're going to be talking about today. Um, it, when naive B cells or T cells that have left the bone marrow or thymus want to go to secondary lymphoid organs, like the lymph node, to start looking for their antigen, that's the same kind of trafficking problem. And when we have an activated T cell, that wants to go to a site of infection to actually get rid of the microbe. It's also the same kind of trafficking problem. So we're going to talk about some big picture steps. And those same steps apply to all of these situations. We'll talk a little bit at the end about some of the unique features of different situations, but we're really always talking about the same general set of steps. And we saw this little video last time. Which is this video. 
where we could see that those blood cells are traveling incredibly quickly, particularly relative to their size. So if you think about it, you know, those are traveling multiple of their size per second. So if you were traveling multiple of your size per second, that would be pretty freaking fast. <laughs> um, they're in a super dense <laughs> vessel. They're, you know, they're really crowded in there. Um, and somehow a cell has to know when it's in that vessel. Aha, I am now in the nose. I should leave the blood and go into the nose. <laughs> or, I should stay in the blood now and go into some other tissue. And so somehow these cells, while moving this quickly, need to be able to identify different areas of the body and leave this flow in order to go to whichever site. In the case of the neutrophil, that site is the site of infection. In the case of the naive B cell or T cell, that site is the secondary lymphoid organ, like the lymph node. In the case of the activated T cell, that site is the infected tissue. And we made this parallel to uh, driving on a really big highway. And so we're going to continue to think about driving on a really big highway. So let's imagine that you are driving fast. I won't put out a speed uh, that you're driving because you can pick for yourself what you consider fast. Um, if I you know, start to tell you speeds, then perhaps I'm telling you too much about my driving. Um, so you're driving at a very fast speed on, I don't know, some five lane highway. And because you're actually going so fast, you're like all the way in the left lane and it's packed. Now you're getting close to your exit. Step one, how do you know it's your exit? Yeah, there's a sign. So there's some kind of marker that marks different places as being different from one another. So one thing that we're gonna have to look for here are some biomolecules that are going to be acting as the signs. When you see your sign that tells you your exit is coming, what are you going to do? Yep. Um, move closer to that side. So you're going to move over to perhaps the right side. So you're going to move to the side instead of being in the middle of the stream of traffic. OK, so you're going to move over. Anything else you might do? And you're going to slow down, right? My computer doesn't like this now. OK. So when we look at the steps that our cells are going through, we can divide them into these four types of steps. And the first step is a step called rolling. Rolling really is something that you can think of as moving to the side and slowing down, just like you would do in the highway. And as you might expect, rolling is going to be mediated by a particular sign on um, that we are going to be able to have on the the surface of the cell. And so um, in particular, roll the sign that we have with rolling is something called a selectin. And a selectin is a type of protein. You've heard the word lectin before in this class. 
and you will notice that lectin is at the end of selectin. What does a what was what is a lectin? Yep. It's in the MLB pathway. It's in the MLB pathway. Yep. So what does the word lectin mean? So a lectin is a protein that binds to a specific other thing. Specifically, lectins bind to carbohydrates. So in mannose binding lectin, the MBL pathway, the lectin bound mannose. Selectins also bind carbohydrates because they're actually a type of lectin. So our selectins will bind to some kind of carbohydrate ligand. You can see one example, um, the vascular address in CD34, um, binding to uh, a selectin, L-selectin. I am just currently noticing something I really don't like about that figure, but that's okay. I'll get past it. Um, in total, there are really only three selectins. Their name, they are L-selectin, P-selectin, and E-selectin. Yes, this lists another one, but L-selectin, P-selectin, E-selectin are the big ones. They each bind to different carbohydrates. They are each found on different types of cells. And I'll tell you, with our, those three ideas of the neutrophil versus the naive B cell or T cell versus the activated B cell or T cell. The end today, I'll sort of give you the specifics of, in this case, it's this selectin and this carbohydrate, and this is how they're set up. But right now, you just need to know there's a selectin binding to some carbohydrate. The binding between selectins and their carbohydrate ligands is relatively weak. It's not a super strong binding affinity. If it was a really, 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 really strong binding affinity, the thing that would happen would be the cell would be going fast, running through the blood vessel, and then it would you know, hit this protein-carbohydrate interaction that's really strong, and it would stop immediately. And just like on the highway, if the cell was in the middle of the stream going really fast and then suddenly stopped, all the other cells would crash into it. It would get sheared in half. Disaster would strike. The selectin carbohydrate interaction is pretty weak. And so what will happen is the cell will sort of catch on the on its ligand which will basically serve to kind of pull that cell over to the side but not stop the cell so then as the blood keeps pushing that cell the cell is going to come off and it's going but it might then attach again and attach again and attach again and this is going to be sort of like velcro where we're going to have lots of sort of shorter term attachments so the cell is basically pulled over to the side and slowed down. So it's getting ready for some of the next steps where it is going to stop. But first, we're slowing down so we can be ready to exit. Here, you can see a video about rolling. I have no idea if we're going to be able to hear the sound, but let's try. Leukocytes are white blood cells that help fight infection. At sites of injury, infection, or inflammation, cytokines are released and stimulate endothelial cells that line adjacent blood vessels. The endothelial cells then express surface proteins called selectin. Selectins bind to carbohydrates displayed on the membrane of the leukocytes, causing them 
to stick to the walls of the blood vessels. This binding interaction is of sufficiently low affinity that the leukocytes can literally roll along the vessel walls and search for points to exit the vessel. There, they adhere tightly and squeeze between endothelial cells without disrupting the vessel walls, then crawl out of the blood vessel into the adjacent connective tissue. Here, leukocyte rolling is observed directly in an anesthetized... So notice how quickly these cells are moving. And then this nice, slow rolling. Two blood vessels are shown. The upper one is an artery with blood flowing from right to left. The lower one is a vein with blood flowing from left to right. Leukocytes only adhere to the surface of veins. They do not crawl out of arteries. Some leukocytes are firmly attached and are in the process of crawling through the vessel walls. Whereas others have already left the vessel, and are seen in the surrounding connected tissue. When the blood flow is stopped temporarily by gently clamping the vessels, we can appreciate how densely both vessels are filled with red blood cells. Red blood cells do not interact with the vessel walls and move so fast under normal flow that we cannot see them. When the blood flow is restored, some of the leukocytes continue rolling whereas all non-interacting cells are immediately washed away by the shear. So that really lets you see this. Oop, that's the wrong set thing. This one. Um, that lets you see this first step of rolling where we're going to have the selectins interacting with carbohydrate ligands, basically pulling that cell to the side, you could, so you could see the cells that were rolling along the side of the vessel, and slowing them down, prepping them for the next step of this process. You can also see rolling here. Um, this video is a cell biology video. It actually basically shows all of cell biology, but I'm only going to show you parts of it. She also pronounces weird words in a really weird way in a couple places, some of which I'm going to skip over. That's fine. Um, it's called the inner life of a cell. Um, I tried when I tried to click this link. This link was dead, but it's the inner life of a cell. And if you just Google that, it comes up everywhere. This was actually this is really what these things look like. Um, a science animator took structural biology images and animated them. So this is really what all, all this stuff looks like. And at the beginning, we're going to see cells moving through a vessel, and you'll be able to see some cells rolling. With dramatic music. And so there you can see the selectins catching to the carbohydrate ligands, and they're basically going ahead and allowing that leukocyte to roll by having short-term connections where they catch and release, catch, release, allowing that leukocyte to roll, as you saw at the beginning, along the surface of the vessel. Come on. So there, you can see the rolling. Yay, rolling. <laughs> okay. There's so many great parts about that video, and there are also so many ridiculous parts about that video. Once our cell has started rolling, it is able to start kind of looking for the signs it needs for the next step. This step is listed here as activation. Um, there are a few different ways you can describe this step. Um, so activation is one way we can describe this step. Another, the way that I often think about this step of activation is that this so step 
is a step that involves chemokine signaling. Um, I tried to um, do some, very, some of my very poor art skills. You'll see I do not have a PhD in art. Um, you can often find out that I don't have a PhD in art um, by combining figures from two textbooks. <laughs> um, so our chemokines have receptors. Um, those receptors have um, seven transmembrane domains, and so this is a nice uh, chemokine receptor binding to some kind of chemokine. So j with the previous step of rolling, the signs were the selectin binding to the carbohydrate li uh, ligand. Here, we're going to have a chemokine binding to a chemokine receptor. Um, chemokine receptors are G uh, protein coupled receptors, as you can see here. Um, and so when the chemokine binds to the chemokine receptor, there's a signal, signaling cascade that happens in the cell. And all these things happen. <laughs> um, so we get changes to the cytoskeleton, changes to adhesion, differentiation, all sorts of things that the cell needs in order to undergo chemotaxis. So we're going to get a lot of signals into the cell when our chemokine is binding to the chemokine receptor. When we are naming chemokines, just like with the CD system we talked about earlier in the semester, um, and with some aspects of cytokines that you may have caught on to and you will see much more this semester, um, we have a naming system for chemokines. Um, chemokines tend to fall into one of four classes, the CXC chemokines, the CC chemokines, the XC chemokines, the CX3C chemokines. That's based on some aspect of their structure. And so we name, chemokines might have a name like CXCL4. If there's an L, that means it's a chemokine. CXCL4, CCL5. That means that's the chemokine. We also might have CXCR4, CCR5. If there's an R, that's the receptor. The numbers don't match, it's super annoying. So, you know, CCR5 does not bind to CCR4 because that would just be too easy. Um, but if you see something with, an, with naming that looks like this, it's a chemokine. Um, and remember, of course, the chemokine is a secreted small molecule. It's basically like a cytokine binding. And so if it has an L in its name, like CXCL8, you can see it here, it will bind to a chemokine receptor like CXC. Oh, that should say, yeah, oh, I know why they did that, because that one has a weird name. But it could be like CXCR8 or something like that. That's not a real name, but what was I pretend it is? Um, Different cells will have different chemokine receptors. This is also true that um, you know, different locations, so different structural cells might have different chemokine receptors. So here you can see a neutrophil having some chemokine receptors. You have the burgundy one and the pink one and the red one. Basophils have some different ones, eosinophils, monocytes, all of these cells have different ones. The T cell has different ones when it's resting and when it's activated. What this means in terms of having different chemokine receptors is that each of these cells can be brought to a different location. So the particular chemokine receptor you have will influence which kind of trafficking process you will go through. In a lot of ways, we think about leukocyte trafficking as being a little bit like area codes. So this is like, I'm now just realizing this is going to become an even harder thing to explain in the future as area codes become less important because of cell phones. But that's OK. We're going to just deal with it now. So right now, if in my phone I hit 9 as the beginning number, I could be trying to call someone in New Jersey with 973. 
I also could be trying to call someone in North Carolina with 919. But then when I dial the second number, that further narrows it down. And when I dial the third number, it actually says, ah, we, now we know a specific part of the country she's trying to call. It's the same thing. We have a few different options for selectins and carbohydrate ligands. That starts to kind of help the cell narrow down. Oh, this is the location I'm in. Then we have all those different types of chemokines and chemokine receptors that further sort of narrow down the location. You can kind of think about it that each body site or each different situation in your body has an area code, a particular selectin, a particular chemokine receptor, a particular protein that's involved in the third step um, that will each signify that location and help that particular cell go to its individual location. And so each of these cells could go to different locations because of their different chemokine receptors. Some of them have the same chemokine receptor. They could potentially end up going to the same location. Or maybe they could go to a different location because they had different selectins for the first step or because they have different other proteins for the third step. Um, so the chemokine step um, is really this important signal transduction step where we get some activation happening for our rolling. And what you should have seen here is that there are a lot of things changing in that cell when that cell gets its chemokine signal. So there are going to be some cytoskeletal changes. There are going to be some differentiation, all sorts of things. That's why we're kind of just generally saying they get activated by the chemokine instead of talking about individual specific events. Yep, Michael. Um, it varies based on uh, which situation we're talking about. So I have not specified that yet. <laughs> um, so, all right. Our cell has moved over. Our cell has slowed down. Our cell has gotten some more information from some signs to say, yeah, this is the place. <laughs> But we have to have one additional big event happen. This additional event is uh, referred to as either arrest or adhesion. Um, I've also heard it listed as stopping. And this uses the third set of proteins that are part of our area code and helping our cell know which place it's going. This third type of, cell of uh, interaction happens with a protein called an integrin. Um, and integrins bind to um, cell adhesion molecules or CAMs, as you can see here. There are a few different CAMs. Um, that we can go through. You can also see some integrins and their CAMs um, that they bind here. Again, there are a bunch of options allowing us to get to that area code type of setup where each location might have a different code to have a cell go there. There are a couple of things that you should notice about integrins. Um, integrins have two chains, um, an alpha chain and a beta chain. They are usually named by which alpha chain and which beta chain they have. So we might have the alpha 4 beta 1 integrin or the alpha 4 beta 7 integrin. Um, and you can see that uh, here. But there's one other really important piece of information to know about integrins. What you might guess from this figure, the figure on the previous slide, all the figures about integrins, and even the name of this step, arrest, sometimes called firm arrest, adhesion, stopping. 
what is going to happen to the cell at this point? Yeah? It's going to not roll anymore. Remember our cell was kind of rolling slowly along the side of the vessel? It's going to not roll anymore. What, in fact, is it going to likely do? Yeah. Stop. Come to a complete stop. Right? It was rolling, rolling, rolling. It was fast. And then it was rolling, so fast, rolling, stop, right? That's what the cell's going to do. Do you think, and the stopping is going to be happening because of the interaction between the integrin and the integrin ligand. Do you think that the integrin, integrin ligand binding, or the integrin cam binding, is strong or weak? Strong. Why do you think it's strong, Michael? Um, because since it's still in the vessel, you, like it's still being pushed by all the cells, so you want it to hold on tight so it's going to Yeah, you need that cell to hold on tight if it's going to totally stop in the midst of all of that fast moving stuff. What would happen if a cell was going fast through the blood vessel? If I was a lot younger, I could like do some cartwheels now or something, be the cell. What would happen if the cell was, you know, going fast through the vessel, had not done rolling, had not done activation, and had its integrin bind to a cam by mistake when it hadn't done the earlier steps? What would happen? Yeah. It could be ripped in half. What were you going to say, Karame? It, this, this cell is going to basically be going super, super fast and then suddenly have this strong binding interaction happen. It's not going to have pulled over. It's not going to have slowed down. It is going to be ripped in half. You can imagine what would happen on a highway in this situation if you're in the middle of the fast-moving lane and suddenly you hit your brakes and just stop yourself in the middle. That would be bad. So what you can realize is that it would be really bad if integrins bound to their ligands by mistake. Integrins exist in two forms on the cell. They exist in a form that is inactive and in a form that is active. Normally, on the cell, the integrins are inactive. The cell requires a signal in order to activate the integrin. Based on what I have told you so far, could you imagine a signal that might tell the cell, OK, you can activate your integrin now? When, what might be a good signal to the cell to activate the integrin? Christina. From the chemokine. So in fact, what happens is that the activation step, this chemokine signaling step, also t prepares the integrin so that we can do the adhesion step. So you can't actually have adhesion happen if you haven't had activation happen previously because you don't have your integrin ready to go. Part of the signaling that happens with the chemokine is in terms of activating the integrin. Um, and you can see some examples of this here. So the top is a version from your textbook. The bottom are similar versions from other textbooks. On the cell at the beginning, the integrin is in a form that is inactive. It's not able to bind to its ligand. If we get a signal to that integrin, the integrin changes its conformation and now is able to bind. This is actually what the structure really looks like. Um, 
Integrins on the surface of the cell are in a structure that is known as the jackknife conformation. So if you think about like a Swiss army knife that folds up, they're normally folded up. When the cell gets a signal from a chemokine, they expand, they extend. And so this is really what that integrin looks like, both before in that bent or jackknife conformation and then extended where it will be able to bind to its ligand. So now we have this really high affinity interaction that will bring the cell to a complete stop. And so we can see this here. We have to go through some cell biology first, skipping the cell biology. All right, we'll start about here. There's a chemokine binding to a chemokine receptor. Signals happen through the G-protein coupled receptor. That makes the integrins activate. <laughs> the integrins activate and now we're able to bind to their ligands, bringing the cell to a stop. So our cell first does some rolling, then it will actually stop at a particular location and crawl through the walls of the vessel. And I apparently picked the version, yeah, chemokine, integrin, stopping and going through the wall. Apparently I picked a version when I Googled this that didn't have narration and honestly, I don't love the narration, so I'm okay with that. Um, the final step, which you also saw in that video, um, is the step where the cell actually crawls out of the vessel in between the adjacent cells um, of the vessel. This step has a few different terms. Whoa, oh, there's a video still going. We don't need to see the day in the life of the motor protein. Um, this step has um, a few different names. Um, one of them is shown here, which is diapedesis. Um, it's also known as transendothelial migration or extravasation. Um, basically what you can see happens is our uh, leukocyte will pretty dramatically change its shape um, and crawl between two adjacent um, cells of the blood vessel wall. This step is understood far less than the other steps. As you might imagine, trying to make vessel walls in the lab and make things crawl through them um, is not a particularly easy thing to do. Um, the one thing we do know is that this process is also um, heavily impacted by chemokines. Um, and so if you, want, if you have to have a protein for this one, I would say think about chemokines. Yep. So basically, it, it knows, yeah, so to go through a spot in the wall, yeah. Um, would there be any instances where it might mistake, um, like have a mistake and not go through that specific spot? So it probably doesn't, so if, for example, <coughs> this is my blood vessel, probably doesn't really matter if the cell goes through here or here, it's still gonna get into this tissue underneath. Um, so it's going to sort of be going along this 
area and could go through sort of whichever junction is in that area. Um, it would only have a mistake and go in like the totally wrong place of the body if there happened to be a mistake in terms of selectin, a mistake in the chemokine, a mistake in the integrin that would send it through all of those, you know, would have to do all of those things wrong. If, um, if it's in this sort of right location, there isn't really an exact place it has to go through. It could go through either place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is this general process that we see with different cells um, trafficking. And we can kind of think about some of the specific details of this in each of our three different situations, um, particularly thinking about, say, our neutrophil going to a site of infection and our naive T cell going to um, a lymph node. And if we talk through kind of, this sort of answers Michael's earlier question about which proteins are on which things. Um, we'll think about which ones they are and why, and hopefully that'll also help illuminate some of this. Um, so we're first going to think about a neutrophil going to a site of infection. So here is my site of infection. So here's my blood vessel wall. Here's my neutrophil. And this is a very blown up version of the skin of the hand. <laughs> OK? So we're like totally zoomed in on a vessel wall and a neutrophil in the hand right now. Like I said, didn't get a PhD in art. Um, we can, so we're going to see these same three steps of rolling, adhesion, and um, arrest, or sorry, rolling, activation, and arrest. Um, but we can think about specific proteins that are happening here. In the case of the neutrophil going to the site of inflammation, rolling happens because neutrophils have carbohydrate ligands on their surface. While inflamed tissues have P and E selectin. There are a couple different things we can call this carbohydrate ligand. The slide calls it PSGL1, so I'll call it PSGL1. Think about a naive T cell trying to go to a lymph node. It's still the same steps of rolling, activation, arrest. But now the naive cell, really any naive lymphocyte, will have L-selectin on its surface, while the lymph node will have the carbohydrate ligand. So what you can see is that which 
member has which um, thing changes in these two situations. Let me just check something. So let's think for a second about these two situations and why perhaps we might be changing things around in terms of which thing is on which cell. In both cases, one of these things is there all the time. It is constitutive. And one of these things is only turned on some of the time. In all cases of this, the carbohydrate ligands are constitutive. Carbohydrate ligands are on all the time. Let's think about this. Our neutrophil is always a neutrophil. It always wants to go to a site of inflammation, right? It doesn't need to turn on and off the ability to go to a site of inflammation. It always wants to be ready. So it's always making the carbohydrate ligand. The inflamed tissues are only inflamed sometimes after you get a cut on your hand. The rest of the time, that tissue is not inflamed. The rest of the time, that tissue does not want to call in neutrophils. So the selectin gets put on the tissue when the tissue is inflamed. The selectin, the tissue starts making the selectin when it says, hello, neutrophils come here, and it's trying to call in those neutrophils. So that one is inducible while the carbohydrate is always present. We have the opposite situation when the T cell is going to the lymph node. The lymph node is always a lymph node. The lymph node always wants new T cells to come there. And so the lymph node has that carbohydrate always present, calling out lymphocytes. When the lymphocyte is naive, it wants to go to the lymph node, so it has this l selectin on its surface. When it's at different parts of its life and it doesn't want to go to lymph nodes anymore, it can get rid of this and no longer traffic to a lymph node. But the lymph node is still a lymph node. It wants some other naive cell now. So it's going to have that carbohydrate present all the time. Similarly, the inflamed tissue will turn on production of IL-8 which is a really badly named chemokine, and say, and try to draw in neutrophils. So our your regular normal tissue doesn't have P and E selectin. It doesn't have IL-8. But if we have inflammation, if we have an innate immune response happening, we're going to start making P and E selectin and IL-8 to bind to carbohydrate ligands and the IL-8 receptor to allow these first two steps ha to happen. And so again, the, the receptor is there all the time. The chemokine, we actually um, induce um, with inflammation. Um, with the naive lymphocyte, naive lymphocytes um, make CCR7, the receptor. While the lymph nodes constantly make the chemokine ligand, um, CCL uh, 19 and 21. So again, it switched. The selectin and the chemokine, or selectin and the chemokine receptor don't always have to go together. It's unique for each individual situation. So this, again, helps us get into that area code idea, where any particular type of cell going to any particular location needs sort of this kind of unique area code um, type of situation. Um, and then we'll also see a particular um, integrin here 
the integrin is always on the same cell as the chemokine receptor because you have to get a signal from the chemokine receptor to turn on the integrin. And so here we're going to have our integrin LFA1. Um, which is going to uh, bind to its CAM. You can see this here as well, um, where we can see our selectin binding to our um, carbohydrate ligand, our chemokine IL-8 binding to the chemokine receptor, that activating our integrin so that that integrin can bind to a CAM. Um, where is the integrin in the naive lymphocyte lymph node example? Is it on the naive lymphocyte or the lymph node? What do you think? Why do you think it's on the lymph node? Hmm? So the integrin is always wherever the receptor is, wherever the chemokine receptor is. So the integrin is on the, lymph the uh, lymphocyte, and there'll be a CAM on the lymph node. So the only way your integrin can get activated is through um, that signaling that's coming from the chemokine receptor. Um, so here you can see this exact same process that I just told you about. Um, here's the neutrophil, here's the naive lymphocyte. I think it's actually a little more clear um, in the way that I have it written on the board. Um, what's also just sort of key for you to know is that our naive T cell can change its trafficking molecules. That's a big part of what the T cell does differently when it's naive versus when it's activated. When it's naive, it has the molecules to allow it to go to the lymph node, like L-selectin and CCR7. When that cell is activated, that cell does not want to go to the lymph node anymore. That cell now wants to go to the site of infection. So at the beginning, my naive T cell wanted to go to my lymph node, my axillary lymph node, where it could find the vaccine, right? Once my T cell got to the lymph node and found my vaccine, it didn't want to go to more lymph nodes. If it went to more lymph nodes, it would kill lymph nodes. That would be a bad idea. Instead, it wants to go to the lung and kill some virus. And the way that that happens is that the cell has different selectin, different chemokine, chemokine receptor, different integrins. So now that cell, instead of having whatever these trafficking molecules are to go into the lymph node, now has different trafficking molecules to go to other kinds of vessels instead of going into the lymph node. Um, so this is going to be a big change that we see. Um, and so the first step in making this adaptive immune response work is making sure that we can get all of these T cells to the lymph node. When our naive lymphocyte is going to the lymph node, it is specifically entering through a very small vein or venule <laughs> called a high endothelial venule. So you can see here is the high endothelial venule or HEV in the lymph node that is letting all of those naive lymphocytes come in. Um, so where I had on the board that CCL1921 <coughs> carbohydrate ligand are all the lymph node in fact, they're not just the, they're not the whole lymph node. They're a specific part of the, on the specific part of a lymph node called the high endothelial venule or HEV. This is 
basically a blood vessel in the lymph node that is trying to call in any naive leukocyte that it, or any naive lymphocyte that it can. So our high endothelial venule is the specific part of the lymph node that has the carbohydrate ligand that makes CCL19 and CCL21 and that makes the CAM. Um, and what you can see is that these cells are tall and skinny, the, the cells of the wall of this venule. So there's lots of good places for cells to crawl in between them. And that tall skinniness is why they're named high endothelial venules, because they're tall. They're, for, there was a very long time where I was confused about that. And then I was like, oh, it's just that they're tall. That's lame. Um, and so here you can see this process for our naive uh, lymphocyte, particularly our naive T cell, for trafficking it into the lymph node. So we can see we've got our L-selectin on that T cell. It's binding to our carbohydrate ligand. Um, you can then see we've got our chemokine-chemokine receptor interaction, which is specifically CCR7, binding to CCL19 and 21. And now you can see our integrin gets activated, binds to its CAM, and the cell is going to crawl through the wall of the high endothelial venule to go into the lymph node. When it gets into the lymph node, the lymph node is not a homogeneous structure. The lymph node has a bunch of different areas. The T cell really wants to go to the T cell zone. If we were talking about a naive B cell, that naive B cell would really like to go to the B cell zone, <laughs> um, and so on. Um, you can see that there are also different areas in the spleen as well. This further migration is all dependent on chemokine gradients. So there are going to be different chemokines present in different parts of the lymph node to allow the cells to sort themselves into the locations where they need to be. Um, and so this is our first big step that we need to have in order to make our adaptive immune response work is that the first thing that has to happen is that the antigen and the T cell have to get to the lymph node. We can't actually have the antigen and the T cell interacting until they are both in the lymph node. One other really interesting area of emerging research in immunology is that we are actually realizing that fever improves trafficking of cells, particularly integrins. So we often talk about fever as being just raising the body temperature in order to stop microbes from growing. But increasing research has also shown that many of the general immune processes I'm telling you about actually work differently at high temperature. And so our immune response, particularly trafficking through some integrins, the alpha-4 integrins, works better at high temperature. So when we have a fever, we can actually do this trafficking process of moving cells around the body a little bit better. And so you, this is another way you can see the innate immune response um, influencing the adaptive immune response. Um, I will see you guys on Zoom on Friday. Um, and um, remember that lab tomorrow is uh, optional. Um, if you want to work on that experiment with Eileen, please let uh, Eileen and I know. Um, otherwise, you can come if you want to analyze data with Eileen. Um, if you think you can do it by yourself, then go for that too. Um, and I will see you later.